Thank you so much for this uh, great welcoming. Uh, it's, this really makes me feel uh, very good to stand here. And uh, it's, it's not a strange place at all. I mean, this building I hadn't seen before. And I can only congratulate you to this wonderful uh, building. It's, uh, it's exciting. It's, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, even that uh, technology doesn't seem to work properly. But that's, uh, that, I'm sure you will fix that some, sometime. Um, it, is, it is not my first time uh, on this campus, I must say. I've, I have had the privilege to be here several times already. And it's always, uh, it's always great to come here, because um, most of all, because of the people uh, that I meet uh, and that I see again. And it's, uh, so it really makes me feel like coming home, in a way. It's, uh, you know, it's, and it's, of course, easy when you have a last name like Enz uh, that, that connects to a lot of you people uh, anyway. But it's, it's, just, uh, it's just a wonderful place to be. And uh, I, I want to acknowledge uh, the presence of Helmut Harder, uh, who has, uh, I mean, you could not have presented that title in English if it, was not be, it, if it hadn't been Helmut translating that book. Uh, so he dedicated a lot of his lifetime to that very difficult academic German style of writing and trying to make sense of what I tried to say there. In English, it sounds much more, it's much more coherent, I find. It's, so I, it's <laughs> Thank you for coming. It's, it's great to see you. And uh, other friends. Paul Dirksen has been with us in Amsterdam uh, during the fall. That was, that was great, uh, together with Julie also. Carl Koop, I know, for years and years. And every time we meet, uh, it's, it's a great joy. And, and so on and so on. I don't, I, I cannot, uh, I, I don't want to go too much into that. I'm invited to give a lecture tonight, so I, it's, uh, it's, but it feels like being, being among friends and colleagues, and that's, uh, that's of course, great. Now, that, uh, that helps me also, of course, to deal with, the, with uh, this challenge now that, uh, you know, I have been sitting all afternoon preparing wonderful slides, and now I will be, I will be the only one watching at these slides. <laughs> How about that? That's quite, uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, so I can please myself here with beautiful pictures. Uh, I, I'm sure I will have a good time. I'm, I'm a bit concerned about you guys. Uh, I hope you will, well, if you, if you get bored, you just imagine some beautiful pictures and, and, and diagrams and wonderful words and uh, yeah, you know, create your own world. Uh, I hope you can, you can think along with me. Uh, as, as we do this. Uh, it's, it's good to have sunshine in this room, and I, I, it's a blessing, so it's, it's, it's good. It's a good space. Um, I was only able to work on these slides and on this public lecture this afternoon because, and that's another person that I have to acknowledge here, because of my friend and assistant, Andres Pacheco Lozano, who's sitting there in the back, uh, humble as he is, uh, originally from Colombia. I only accepted this wonderful invitation to teach at the Canadian Peacebuilding Summer School uh, because I checked with Andres if he would help me. Because these people make you teach like five days in a row from age to five. <laughs> now then, that's a wonderful invitation, but then you think, do I know enough to speak for such a, to teach for such a long time? Is that, is that really possible? And, and how would that work? And you don't get your nap after lunch and, and things like that. I mean, it's, it's, I always thought we Germans are a bit crazy about working ethics and, and organizing things. But I mean, Wendy, you have uh, proven that uh, it, things can even be done better than in Germany. In, <laughs> it's, it's, it's impressive. I'm learning. I'm learning. No, it's great to be, to be a, me a member of this summer school and on peace building, not just because of the topic, uh, which is so dear to all of us, but it's also it's a wonderful community. I get to know a lot of brilliant students uh, and to, to think with them and to discuss with them. I don't have the impression that I'm lecturing all the time or I'm teaching. It's actually sharing wisdom, sharing experiences and rethinking theology uh, because we believe that theology is really the grounding of our ethics. So when we talk peace building, of course, there's a lot of praxis uh, that we talk, uh, but that is rooted in ethics and ethics for us is, of course, then rooted again in theology. So you need to do all of that. And to do that together, uh, learning together, discerning together, the way is, is, is wonderful. It's, it's a privilege. Thank you for this invitation. A transformative spirituality for peace building. Uh, I will speak about the ecumenical pilgrimage of justice and peace that has been initiated by the World Council of Churches. 
uh, a pilgrimage of justice and peace. Now, you have to keep that in mind. You know, these words, you cannot see them, I know, but you've, that's, that's important. Pilgrimage of justice and peace. That is a new program. And I want to start with a biblical verse uh, that has, uh, for me personally, become very important on this pilgrimage of justice and peace. You will understand in, in, a, in a while what this pilgrimage talk is all about. It's a verse from, from the Hebrew Bible, Micah 6, verse 8, uh, where we read, You have been told, O humankind, what is good and what God looks for in you. Nothing other than to practice justice, to love kindness, and to walk gently with your God. I'm sure there are other translations uh, possible. Uh, I know that there are some Old Testament scholars among us. Uh, I don't care about that. <laughs> I love this. I love this translation. Uh, it is. It is. It is uh, telling me so much about the wisdom of a pilgrimage. Nothing other than to practice justice, to love kindness, and to walk gently with your God. Now, to walk gently with your God, that tells us already. Like who is really walking and who is participating in this walk. And it informs us also about the way we can participate in this pilgrimage of justice and peace that is actually God's pilgrimage in which we are invited to participate in a gentle way. Micah 6, verse 8. So I want to take you to the uh, assembly of the World Council of Churches, the 10th assembly, that took place in Busan in South Korea in 2013. So that's already five years ago. Uh, during this assembly, uh, a lot of things were discussed, as always, a lot of business was, was, was to be done. But for us Mennonites, some of us Mennonites are member churches of the World Council of Churches, as you know, uh, even founding members, and that's especially the Mennonite uh, Church in the Netherlands and the Mennonite Church in Germany. And so we have been on this ecumenical table for a while, and we have learned a lot, and we were able to contribute a lot. After this decade to overcome violence that, uh, that Wendy talked about, uh, of course, there was an eagerness on our side, and with many others, how to proceed, how to move on. Because, I mean, it was a bit bold in those days uh, to propose a decade to overcome violence, uh, because that sounds like, okay, you have 10 years, and then you have overcome all the violence. Uh, well, that was, uh, I always excuse myself by explaining that that is eschatological language, but uh, not, not everybody <coughs> was buying into that. Um, the idea then was actually to have to focus uh, 10 years of, uh, of a lot of work uh, done by the World Council of Churches and the member churches to dedicate that to peace work, to put peace and justice, bring it from the periphery to the center uh, of the life and work of the churches. Now that was, that for Mennonite years, that's not, that's not big news. Uh, for a body like the World Council of Churches, that is quite, that was quite a commitment. Now how to move on after those 10 years, how to move on? Uh, so uh, there, was, there was, of course, the assembly in 2013 was a good opportunity to prepare for that and also to start to think uh, what is next? How do we, how do we, how can we build on all the experiences uh, that we have gathered so far? Um, now, a quotation that I want to read to you from the message uh, of this uh, assembly in Busan. Um, there's, always, there's always lots of documents, uh, <clears throat> some of them more boring, some of them more interesting. Uh, what, is, what, what tries to bring it to the point is always the message that is a short text, a condensed uh, text that is, that is, that is uh, trying to summarize things. At the end of this text, we can read by this ecumenical family, World Council of Churches, we intend to move together. Challenged by our experiences in Busan, we challenge all people of goodwill to engage their God-given gifts in transforming actions. This assembly calls you to join us in a pilgrimage. May the churches be communities of healing and compassion, and may we seat the good news so that justice will grow and God's deep peace rest on the world. 
you can find that that whole message in the uh, in the internet, of course. Uh, so that's that's easy to to find. Message from the assembly in Busan. Uh, it is it is a great invitation to a pilgrimage of justice and peace. So that was a decision taken during that assembly, and that is to continue this way of the World Council of Churches uh, on, on, in, in terms of justice and peace. Now what I want to, what I want to talk about uh, tonight then is uh, two uh, major chapters that I have. Uh, one uh, is steps leading to this ecumenical pilgrimage of justice and peace. So what, what, are the, what is the, 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 the ground that we stand on? How, how did we come to that? And then secondly, more focusing on this transformative spirituality the Trinita a Trinitarian foundation of just peace. Too bad you cannot see these pictures. <laughs> so far it was only text. So, <laughs> steps leading to the ecumenical pilgrimage. What have we done so far? Uh, in one of the classes we have, uh, we have talked about the ecumenical movement. And one of the things that we have looked at is at the history of the World Council of Churches, and, and more than that, even starting in 1910 with the first World Missions Conference, uh, which is actually called the initiation of the, the modern ecumenical movement. And we have looked at that as a peace movement. So you can, you, can, you can design and you can describe the whole history of the ecumenical movement actually as a peace movement. What else is it? I mean, different churches, different traditions coming together finally stopping to kill each other, finally not you know, defining their identity over against the other, but talking to each other, wanting to pursue something together, wanting to learn from each other, wanting to teach each other, of course, that's always the case, but also are willing to listen to each other. So in my, in my, in my reading, the ecumenical movement is nothing else but a peace movement. That's, that's what it's all about. And you can turn that around and you can also say, well, then it means for a peace church, that you have to be ecumenical or you're not a peace church. That, is the, that, is, that would be the, the follow-up sentence there. So what are the steps? So we, we could start in 1910, but I, we don't have so much time. Sorry, you have to come to the, to the uh, Peace Building Summer School uh, if you want to know more about that. Uh, I, will, I want, just want to remind you of some steps uh, that are more recent. Uh, there was in this country, in Vancouver, in 1983, an assembly of the World Council of Churches. And where was it? You were all there, of course. It was in Vancouver. It was not here. It was in Vancouver, 1983. And that assembly was really uh, very important for our topics because it has launched a conciliar process on justice, peace, and the integrity of creation. In those days, that was, that was a bold step uh, as well. A conciliar process, that's already telling us something about pilgrimage, a way, it is a process. A, con a conciliar process on justice, peace, and the integrity of creation. It was the first time that justice and peace was brought together in such a way, and on top of that, including the integrity of creation. Now that was, it was until that until that time that was so that that was new for us. Now it's it's just it has become part of our peace ethics uh, to include our relationship to the environment. What are, what are we, how, do we, how do we make peace with the environment that we live in? That's very important, that has, that has grown to us. But that was 80, 83, that was, that was new. So that, that was a decision taken uh, in Vancouver. Second, uh, second building block, so to speak, in that, uh, in that history is then, of course, the decade to overcome violence. Uh, and uh, a lot has been done, a lot has been written, a lot of, a lot of steps have been taken. A lot of churches around the world and communities especially have learned how to become a peace church and that doesn't mean copy-paste Mennonites. Uh, that's, it's not that easy uh, because we, know our, we Mennonites know ourselves. So it's not, it's not, when I say peace church in that regard, it's really an ecclesiological term and not so much a denominational term. Um, but this decade to overcome violence has led us then and brought us also to develop a common understanding on just peace. Just peace as a new concept, uh, as we call it, or sometimes it is, it is described as a paradigm, a new paradigm of ecumenical social ethics. 
Now that is something. This is, I'm not talking about the historic peace churches who come together and they, they decide together that just peace is at the center of doing social ethics. This is the ecumenical body, the ecumenical world, deciding together that this is really at the heart of what it means to do social ethics. <clears throat> There's a wonderful document that uh, the students have, uh, have had to look at uh, and had to digest, uh, the Just Peace Companion. Uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful document, I think very rich, uh, and uh, the great thing is that we were able to write that together as churches from different, uh, from different backgrounds. And we discussed it and, and finalized it 2011 at the World Convocation, International Ecumenical Peace Convocation, it was called, in Kingston, Jamaica, 2011. So that's another building block that we have. It's the conciliar process of justice, peace, integrity of creation. It is this new understanding, common understanding on just peace, uh, which is quite important. Now, in this, in this common understanding, we have hammered out also a definition that you cannot see on the wall, but I will read it to you. Uh, just peace is a collective and dynamic yet grounded process. Peace, just peace, peace is not, is not something that, that you, you work towards and then you have it. It is an ongoing process, it is never finished. It's a collective and dynamic yet grounded process of freeing human beings from fear and want, of overcoming enmity, discrimination and oppression, and of establishing conditions for just relationships that privilege the experience of the most vulnerable and respect the integrity of creation. So there are several aspects here uh, that, that need, need some highlighting. I, I cannot, we don't want to spend too much time on that, but there is a common definition on what just peace, what we mean when we say just peace. It's, and the, the key term here is building just relationships. Very important. Just peace, we have put these words together and some, some authors, some theologians like Glenn Stassen and others have, uh, David Gushy, they have also worked with that. They have developed all these whole concept also of just peace. We have, we have learned a lot from, from different sources and it makes so much sense in so many different uh, contexts and so many different uh, situations to so many different societies, communities, that justice and peace always go hand in hand. As Psalm 85 would say, when justice and peace kiss each other, this is when you can talk about a shalom. So never think peace without justice and never think justice without peace. That's, uh, I, I see I'm preaching to the choir here. You are so Mennonite. <laughs> it's in, in, some, in some circles, this is quite like, what? Okay, uh, a bit more on that def definition. The way of just peace. So in 2011, we al already talked about the way of just peace. It was not just like that is a situation that we work towards. We work towards peace. No, it is, it is always talking in ways of process, in talking, in talking in terms of the way. The way of just peace is fundamentally different from the concept of just war. And much more than criteria for protecting people from the unjust use of force. So it's not just that. It is, in addition to silencing weapons, social justice, the rule of law, respect for human rights, and shared human security. Now, these are very important terms for uh, in some societies where that is not guaranteed. Some of us live in a privileged uh, situation where we can embrace all that and we can, we can enjoy all that. I don't have to, to go into different contexts here. Social justice, the rule of law, respect for human rights, and shared human security. Security, very important. Think of northern Nigeria, think of Israel-Palestine, think of Colombia, Think of, of places you might have been to. Okay, so it's not, this just peace talk is not just over against, oh, in former times we were into just war and now we move into just peace. It is much more than that. Being against war, that's a given thing. We're all against war. And that's in ecumenical circles, uh, that, is, that, that, is a common, uh, that is common sense. Of course, it becomes very tricky when, when we go into detail and into contextual uh, questions then, and when it, when, it, when it goes into some situations like when, when the security of a people is not guaranteed. It, then, I mean, then you, then you see again, you know, all the men, different mentalities of traditions that you fall back, like we also do, like you know, our first reflex is always like, but no violence, that's, that's impossible, we shall not do that. We are Christians, we are followers of Christ. 
And the same happens to, to some of these other traditions. It's always like, yeah, but you know, sometimes, we, yeah, we are against war for another, we understand that, but, but sometimes, you know, you have to understand there's just, and there are some criteria. And so you, you draw back on this, on this just war theory again. It's amazing how, that, how powerful that, uh, that is. It, it is. This is why I call it a mentality. It is, is much more than just reflection. Um, so the just peace talk is much more than just replacing that just war talk. It is much broader, it is much wider, because peace and justice is not, we cannot just uh, reduce justice and peace to our talk about are you for or against wars. That would be too simplistic. Now what we did in Jamaica was then to try to explore the different fields of just peace and try to understand, so what are, what are the dimensions? If we, if we blow it up like that, if we, if we make it really broad, this whole concept. We were talking about peace in the community, that was very important, justice within societies, we were talking about peace among peoples. That's all this talk about war and peace and international law, very important. We were talking about peace in the marketplace, as we called it. Now, economic uh, justice, uh, very important. And if, if you could see the slide, then I, I put peace and justice always, always in line so that, that, that it's immediately clear, okay, justice and peace, that goes hand in hand in all these different uh, fields. And peace with the earth, of course, think about ecological justice and climate justice. So you have these four fields, and we were quite proud that we were able to hammer those out and, and discuss all that in different groups, uh, with all these different denominations, uh, with all these different representatives from other religious bodies as well. Uh, and, uh, and out of that came this, 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 companion, this Just Peace Companion, which is a fine ecumenical document, one of the best pieces that the ecumenical movement has produced so far, also available on the internet. Make sure that you get the second edition, I should always say, because we have, we have continued to work on that uh, a bit. <clears throat> now what we missed, if you would see this now, uh, I could ask you now, what, is, is, is there something missing? Have we covered everything? Uh, when, I, when, I, when I talk about these things, then usually people say, at least I should contextualize that, at least in the Netherlands, then they, they say, but what about, uh, what about peace with yourself? Yes. The, yeah, yeah, that was uh, my first reaction. So when I heard these reactions at, uh, in the beginning, I would say that, yeah, guys, you know, that's, you're so concerned about yourself always, you know, it's like, but, and peace starts with yourself. And it's, you know, it's if you don't have peace in your heart and, you know, it's so, and you say like, yeah, I mean, really, this is not about preaching. This is about, this is about, you know, exploring these fields and, and why are you saying that? But, I, but I've learned. I, have, I really must say, I'm, and I'm, I'm grateful for, for these remarks, because it, because it came back time and again. When I, whenever I, I unfold that list, people say, but what about peace with yourself? And I, I have learned that uh, that is adding something that we also discussed then in the preparation of the Busan Assembly. Because we had some discussions there with uh, especially representatives from the Orthodox churches uh, they were complaining that this looks all very nice and, it's, and we agree to everything that you guys do there, you, basically you, pro you Protestants, with international law and that's also important and, it's, and that's, that's what we all care about. So. But they kept asking the question, how, does, how, what is that, how is that different from an NGO agenda? Why, why are we saying that as churches? What is the, what is the theology here? What is the, what is the what is the faith? What is the spirituality behind this? And shouldn't we, this is what I heard them saying time and again, shouldn't we look at all these areas that you have labeled there so nicely, shouldn't we talk about them as spiritual crisis instead of just analyzing it in a political way with all our knowledge, uh, with all our expertise? Uh, isn't it coming back to us, especially as churches, as spiritual crisis? Well, there again, I thought, yeah. Of course, it's also a spiritual crisis, but let's see, let's, you know, let's analyze, let's, let's, you know, it's about advocacy, it's about going there, it's about talking to these politicians, it's about, you know, uh, being together with the NGOs, uh, you know, make, make alliances wherever you can, you know, it's about building peace, and we, and we are called to do that. But it, 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 it kept coming back, and, it's, and, and we learned then in the preparation for Busan, we say we have to, we have to look at that. There is something, there's something uh, about this that is, that is really speaking to us and that, that calls us back to the tables and say, well, why are we saying these things as churches? 
How do we differ from Amnesty International? How do we differ from, from, from some other great, great groups uh, that are doing great work? Why do we speak like that as churches? What is the theological foundation here? And is there a different perspective that we would bring to that table? Or are we just saying the same things that the others are doing? This is, uh, and, and if, if I go back to that wonderful document that I just have described, uh, then I'm, I see that. I see that missing. That we have, it's, it's, all, it's all great what we said there. And it was so interesting, I have to tell you the story. It was so interesting during that, that uh, great conference in Jamaica, we were sitting there uh, discussing this document and we had invited some, some representatives from other faiths as well. So Jewish representatives, Muslim, Hindus, Buddhists. And we said, you, we want you to look at our paper and you should comment on it. Tell us what you think. And it was a Muslim from South Africa who was saying, he was praising it in, in, in the highest tones. He was saying, this is great, this is wonderful, I could sign all of this. But what I don't understand with, you, with this paper is that Whenever I go into a church, then I see in most of these churches this man hanging on the cross. And, I, and, and, then, and I'm always puzzled with that because I don't get it. But you Christians always tell us Muslims that this is the key element of our faith. This is, if you don't understand that, then you, you, you are, have not understood Christian faith yet. Now, if, you, if that is so important for you, why do I not find anything about that in your document? Well, then you stand there really being humble and say like, whoa, 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 maybe, maybe we should go back to, to, the, to our tables and, and rethink and, and work on this again. Because it's, it's I mean, it's, this, this Muslim colleague and friend has, has pointed his finger exactly there. Uh, this is also what I hear when I listen to the Orthodox representatives. This is what I hear when I listen to some of these old ladies in churches and we say, well, Fernando, but what about peace with yourself? Yeah, that is, that is then, 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 then it comes back to, back, comes back to us, uh, you know, personal faith, spirituality. Isn't that something that we need to put there? So we have, uh, we're still talking about the steps towards this pilgrimage. I want to come to the pilgrimage itself. I should hurry up. Uh, so we, we, said, we said if we continue this journey on, of just, justice and peace, we have to add this spiritu spirituality. Now for a systematic theologian, of course, being trained in Germany most of the time, you, you make a big circle around spirituality. That's, that's dangerous stuff. You know, spirituality, you cannot systemize it. You cannot... Uh, and, and, you know, mystics and spiritualists has, have always been very, very difficult to handle for church structures. These have always been very difficult people in congregations. They are the troublemakers. Uh, they, don't, they, don't, they don't follow any rules. They are, they are, I mean, and that's not, not only true for us. I mean, this is in, I look into the Catholic tradition, medieval churches, early churches, mystics and spiritualists, uh, difficult. Very difficult. So, as a systematic theologian, you would not, you would not touch that. It's, uh, and I was even told by, by my professors, uh, no, that's, that's not what we do. But I've learned in this ecumenical family that, no, we have to do it. So we came up with this pilgrimage metaphor. Because we said, you know, a pilgrimage, uh, at least for some of us, and I, I, I realize that in, in the Canadian context, that, that is quite difficult, pilgrimage. But I will tell you first, for us, it made a lot of sense because we said, uh, you know, that is, we have been talking about justice and peace, just peace, as a journey, as a way, as a, as a process. So if you add spirituality, why don't we talk about a pilgrimage? Isn't that exactly what we mean when we say walking the way of just peace? Shouldn't that be a pilgrimage of justice and peace? So we, we, we brought that proposal, we worked it out, we brought that proposal uh, to, to the floor in Busan and uh, it was accepted. Uh, there was one more, there's one more uh, thing that I need to add here because we first we thought about a pilgrimage towards justice and peace. And it, it took again a brother from Tanzania, he was, uh, he said, no, no, something is wrong here. A pilgrimage towards justice and peace. Then again, you say, well, you work and work and work and then towards justice and peace. It needs to be if, and he, he made that point, he said, if the churches are not communities of justice and peace, why do these churches think that they can preach to the world? Why do they think they would bring peace and justice to the world? 
So it is, it, isn't it coming back to us? And shouldn't we reflect on ourselves and say, who are we actually? Instead of running around in the world trying to save everybody. Is, is, are, we, are we actually in, in the position of preaching that peace and justice? So we, we thought again, and we said, no, it has to be a pilgrimage of justice and peace. That means if we as churches together, if we don't walk the way of justice and peace, and that means if we don't become communities of justice and peace ourselves, stop preaching to the world. Stop trying to pretend as you are the peacemakers. You are not credible. You are not faithful. Now, you can think for yourself. I don't know your congregations, but when I look into my congregation in Hamburg, Altona, uh, sometimes I doubt, you know, are we a congregation of justice and peace? And we have our problems, as every other congregation has. But it's, but it's, but it's good to be reminded to walk a pilgrimage of justice and peace, using that metaphor, means that, yeah, it's, it is also, it does something to ourself. A pilgrim is never, is never just doing something to walk and visit people like we Mennonites do, we love to visit each other, right? Uh, that is a pilgrimage when we have the experience that there's also a spiritual moment and when the place works on us. Because this is, Rowan Williams says that, the place works on the pilgrim. This is what pilgrimage is for. So it is not just walking from station to station, from place to place, in order to visit people and to help these poor people. You know, we go out there in the field and we do something. No, it is you go there and you are transformed by visiting that station, by walking that way, by being received by people, hosted by people. That changes you. If it doesn't change you, don't call it a pilgrimage. And don't call it a pilgrimage of justice and peace. So that is, that is, uh, that is the whole idea, and it was accepted then in Busan. Great picture here from the assembly. Shall I turn this around? No. Yeah. <laughs> You can look at this later if you want. Hmm. But it was, it was accepted uh, that, that we do this because the Orthodox understood, okay, this is finally, these, these Protestants, they finally get it, you know? It's not this, this they, they always come with their peace and justice agenda. Finally, they get it. We need to add spirituality here. We need to make this a, a movement of prayer, a movement of liturgy. All of that needs to be included and we need some solid theology here preferably Trinitarian theology, of course, not this Christocentric uh, limited theology that the Protestants usually do. We have uh, then, since then, we have uh, the General Secretary of the World Council of Churches has uh, called a group together of 25 people, uh, an international reference group on the pilgrimage of justice and peace, uh, and I'm happy to serve on, on this group. It's, it's a privilege. I, I cannot thank my God enough for, for these opportunities because I learned so much and I I get to be on this pilgrimage uh, on behalf of the World Council of Churches. And what we do is we have a focus every year in, in one location, in one region that we visit together uh, and, and try to work on, on program, on theology uh, that helps churches also to understand what this pilgrimage of justice and peace is all about. 2015, we started, uh, focus, was, uh, focus was on climate justice. 2016, we went to, to Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Who has been in Jerusalem and Bethlehem? Hands up. Well, then you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it would be so interesting to hear from you now if you understood your travels as a pilgrimage, or what did you do there? Did you go with an Israeli agency, or did you take in a Palestinian agency? Very interesting questions that we learned there. Palestinian? Bravo. Um, 2017, Nigeria. Uh, we have chosen these locations because we say we have to go to places where uh, the injustices are really felt, where the violence is really, is really present. If this, is not, this is not a pilgrimage like a, like a happy, clappy trip, you know. This is, uh, this is serious stuff that, that we are doing. Um, peace building in context of interreligious conflict. Now, when you go to Nigeria, uh, you can stay in the south. You're pretty much safe because the, the Christians live in the south. Uh, the further north you go, you, you, it becomes more difficult because there's, there's the Muslim uh, majority. And up in the north, in Jos and so on, I mean, you know, you're familiar with that, of course, uh, Boko Haram uh, as one, uh, one extremist group uh, that have, that have uh, destroyed so many villages, that have burned down uh, churches, that have killed people 
especially one of our historic peace churches, the Church of the Brethren, who is, who has, that, that is the, the biggest church of the Brethren in the world is in northern Nigeria. It's unbelievable. It is unbelievable what you see there and what you learn there as a pilgrim on this way. This year we went to Colombia, uh, trying, to, trying to understand what a theology of companionship uh, would tell us. Because this pilgrimage becomes more and more a, a pilgrimage also of justice and peace, of course, but it is also a, a companionship. Now, what is companionship? If you, if you put these words, uh, if you put that apart, then you have compañeros, those who share the bread on the way together. That is very interesting. Do we, can, we become, can we become compañeros to each other in this ecumenical family? Those who share the bread with each other on the way. Compañeros. Uh, and we learned a lot by visiting, visiting uh, people, communities, politicians, NGOs, religious communities uh, in, uh, in Colombia. Next year we will go to Myanmar and Bangladesh and the topic will be racism. Now, Time is running. Uh, transformative spirituality, that's actually the topic. So all of that was just introduction. Now we start. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm, I, have my, I have my watch here, Carl, don't get nervous. I'm nervous. You're nervous, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know, I can, I can see that. Uh, transformative spirituality. Uh, does the name Dorothy Zelle ring a bell with you? Dorothy Zelle, no? Yeah. Well, I'm so glad there's some some people, uh, well, she's, she's a German uh, theologian, uh, uh, so it's, I cannot blame you, but her books are translated. Uh, Dorothe Zelle, she was actually the main speaker at the Vancouver Assembly in 1983. It was a scandal. It was a scandal in Germany, because a woman known as a feminist theologian uh, saying all kinds of terrible things about her Germany on that international floor on behalf of the German churches. You wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it, those discussions that, that uh, were there. She had a hard time. She's one of these prophets. She's one of these mystics uh, that I was talking about earlier, troublemakers. You cannot control these people. They, are, they, don't, they, don't, they don't obey. They don't go with authority. Actually, they fight every authority wherever they see it. Uh, Dorothee Zelle is, is, yeah, you can call her a poet. You can call her... Uh, a theologian, of course, she is uh, very much Union Theological Seminary, was, was happy to accept her because she couldn't get a professorship in Germany. That was not solid theology in those days, uh, and sometimes even nowadays. Uh, she, I, we, have, we have used her, her theology, her thinking, her, her reflections, because what she did, she studied mystics again, mystical uh, traditions, and how that translates into political action how that goes hand in hand. Mystics are not just people, crazy people who go out in the desert and you know, celebrate themselves. <laughs> Mystics are people who get involved, but on a different level. They get involved, driven by a totally different spirit, empowered by wisdom and by truth that some of our churches never, will never touch. It's, it's, it's fascinating to see that. Now think about Anabaptist movement. There were some mystics in the Anabaptist movement, the 16th century crazy people, you know, you, you, it's, it's uh, but we, I mean, if you, if you read them again, it's fascinating. It's fascinating how they translate spirituality into political and societal action in order to bring justice and peace. Now, this is Dorothy Zellis, uh, this was her mission. Three different dimensions that she talked about in, in this, uh, in this, in terms of spirituality, via positiva, via negativa, and via transformativa three dimensions of this spirituality that we use now as the World Council of Churches as we try to understand what this pilgrimage of justice and peace uh, could tell us. Well, how do we do that? What is that? I mean, some of us are really, are really new kids on the block. I mean, as you grow up as a Mennonite, what do you know about pilgrimage? I, I, don't, I didn't know anything. These cats, some of these Catholics know a lot about it. Some, some other traditions, really rich. Three vias, via positiva, via negativa, via transformativa. We have used that as a framework, we have adopted that. Now I want to tell you quickly what that is, via positiva. We have translated that as celebrating the gifts of creation. Celebrating the gifts of creation, that is part of this pilgrimage. If you cannot celebrate the gifts of creation, forget this pilgrimage of justice and peace. If you cannot receive the gifts, 
this pilgrimage will not lead anywhere. Dorothy Zelle describes this in a wonderful way. And, then, and she says that if you, sh you should be amazed. You should be amazed by the beauty of people, by the beauty of nature, by the beauty of this whole creation, because this teaches you how much you are part of this web of life. It is not this anthropocentric approach. It is this, I feel I'm part of this wonderful network that is created in such a marvelous and beautiful way. And by the way, the whole story of creation doesn't start with the fall. Do you know that? I mean, I'm preaching to the theologians here. That whole story doesn't start with the fall. It starts with the original blessing, not with the original sin. Some traditions, I will not label them, uh, have been so obsessed with original sin that they explain every single thing down to peace and, and justice by starting with original sin. It's a fallen creation. I mean, that gives you all the right to say, well, just war criteria. You can, you can develop all kinds of beautiful, not beautiful, crazy things on the basis of that. I mean, it's, it's, I'm overdoing it now. You, you see that. But Dorothy Zeller reminds us it starts with the original blessing. And unless you understand that, you will not be a pilgrim. Celebrating the gifts of creation. Secondly, oh yeah, we can do this little exercise. I love that. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and look into that face and realize that that is the image of God. That person is created in the image of God. Do it. Isn't it amazing that how you, how you look to each other in a different way? That like, wow, that is the image of God. I, before that, I didn't think about it. Now I see it. Now, I, now, I'm, now I'm aware of it. it. It changes. It does something to you. <clears throat> Via negativa, the second dimension, visiting the wounds. Visiting the wounds of violence. Well, that's the difficult part of this whole pilgrimage. That we have learned uh, from Dorothy Zeller and from others. Now we learn it from, from the communities in northern Nigeria, in Colombia, in Palestine. Visiting the wounds, unless you put your body to these wounds of violence, you will not understand this pilgrimage of justice and peace you will not be serious enough about it. That is very, we have, we have written a text down. Uh, I cannot show you all the text here, of course. Visiting the wounds. This is what we said together. This is not, this is not my text. This is, this is what we said together as in, in the World Council of Churches. This pilgrimage will lead us to the locations of ugly violence and injustices. We intend to look for God's incarnated presence in the midst of suffering exclusion and discrimination. We are looking for God's incarnated presence in the midst of suffering, exclusion and discrimination. The true encounter with real contextual experiences of broken creation and sinful behavior against each other might inform us anew about the essence of life itself. It might lead us to repentance and in a movement of purification liberate us from obsession with power, possessions, ego, and violence, so that we become ever more Christ-like. To become ever more Christ-like, this is the second dimension of this, of this pilgrimage. And that means to become ever more Christ-like means to be willing to walk the way of the cross. Now, you cannot walk the way of the cross by by trying to bypass the wounds of violence. This is why it's called the Via Negativa. It is to put your body and your soul and yourself into the locations where you have the impression that even God has left this place. My God, why have you forsaken me? That is the, that is the essence of this Via Negativa. And it is that place where you try to find and search for and long for the presence of God. It's amazing to, to be with people and to visit these wounds when you, when you actually sit with people and these people are saying, God has left us a long time ago. We have no, we have no one to turn to. We don't, know, we don't know what to do. That is, that is a pilgrimage that puts you to these locations where you really feel that, the absence of God. 
But Dolo Tezelu says, if you are not able to walk that way, this is not a pilgrimage of justice and peace. And finally, the Via Transformativa, transforming the injustices, we have called that. Now, moving from that Via Positiva to that Via Negativa, actually, in order to transform injustices, this is what it's all about in the end. It is not about the suffering itself. It is not about the blessing itself. All of that is about transformation. It's about transforming the injustices. We said together, being transformed ourselves, the pilgrimage may lead us to concrete actions of transformation. We may grow in our courage to live in true compassion, compassion, whoever speaks Spanish or Latin, there's the passion, there's passion is in there, the suffering. We may grow in our courage to live in true compassion with one another and with nature. This will include the strength to resist evil, injustice and violence, economic and ecological justice, as well as the healing of the wounded and the striving for peaceful reconciliation is our call in each and every context. The credibility of our actions might grow from the quality of the fellowship we share, a fellowship of justice and peace. That is where the credibility comes from. If we want to be transformers, we need to be transformed first. And this is what this pilgrimage is about, we are hoping. To walk this pilgrimage is, first of all, it will transform us so that we may transform the injustices. Dorothy Zelle calls it to become healed healers. We need healing in order to be healers. And how do we get that? This pilgrimage of justice and peace might lead us into such healing. But the credibility we say together as churches, the credibility really depends on the question, are we becoming ourselves a fellowship of justice and peace? Now, if we had more time, I could show you more about this, how we put that together with a Trinitarian approach here. Think of via positiva, we talked about creation, God the creator. Think of via negativa, walking the way of Christ, walking the way of the cross. Now that is all what we talk about, the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. And we talk about that transformative moment in this pilgrimage. And that is based, then we need to talk about the Holy Spirit who drives this transformation, who is the comforter and who is this transforming uh, part of the Trinitarian community. I'm closing this uh, with, with a quotation uh, from Pastor Salvador Alcantara from El Garzal in Colombia. He's one of these people who live in these communities and who allowed us to visit wounds. A lot of violence has been taking place in that, in that community of campesinos. They have lost a lot of people but they have stayed nonviolent. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they, where they get the strength from. All I know is that it was great to sit at their feet and to listen to them. And that we were received by them and we actually experienced the Via Positiva with them. We celebrated the gifts of creation with their land, with, their, with the blessing that they, that they have. We were talking and sharing the tears when they told us about their wounds. They allowed us to touch their wounds, like Thomas was allowed to touch the wounds of Jesus because he had so many doubts. And we were discovering together what are the possible transformations that we see when we walk together from now on, if we don't allow each other to walk alone. He said, he's a very simple man, he's a campesino, but he's the leader of the community. Defending human rights is a, a way of life, he says. Defending human rights, it's not advocacy, it's not work, it's not NGO, it's not, we have to do that. It's a way of life, he says. It is a collective project that one must take hold of with body and soul in order to bring about change. And once you start, there's no going back, because once you take that first step, 
you are no longer responsible just for yourself, but rather for the entire community. He's a great person. Let me read that verse again from Micah 6, and that's my closing. You have been told, O humankind, what is good and what God looks for in you. Nothing other than to practice justice, to love kindness, and to walk gently with your God. Thank you.